very good quote by one of our former presidents. I think you'll know the name, Thomas Jefferson. He was the third U.S. president, one of the architects of the Declaration of Independence, of course, a very, uh, very important figure in our nation's history. He made a, a very powerful statement that I think we can learn a lot from here today as it springs words into my message this morning. He said this, God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? A conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are a gift from God. That they are not to be violated but with His wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that His justice cannot sleep forever. You know, I look around me today at my beloved nation, and, and to be frank, it, it does concern me about the, the direction that we're going, the, the existence for the next generations to come. It does greatly concern me because of, uh, of the things that are changing so rapidly that we once held so dear and now we're dismissing as not being important anymore. Sometimes even as a person, I feel like I, I have no power, to be honest with you. <laughs> I have no major financial resources. I'm not a multi-billionaire. I'm not a big name preacher by any means or, or an important figure, if you will. I don't have an ability of my, I guess, on my own to change things. I feel that are damaging the very foundations of our society. But it'd be easy for me and for anybody who feels that way to hang their head in despair and say, well, I just don't know if there's much hope. It's just, I guess you just got to go with the flow of the culture. It doesn't matter what direction it's going to go. It's, you know, let live and let live, you know, and, and who cares? However, today the, the scriptures tell me much differently, and I thank God for the scriptures. I, they are the bedrock of my life. And the bedrock of many people's lives. And, and it's something that we can go back to that when all, all else uh, fails, God's word always prevails. And I thank God for it. And I can look at, at things and I can and I can look at the situations and wonder what's going to happen next. Or I can look to God's Word and say, hey, there is a solution to things. There is hope for this nation. It's hope for any nation that looks to this book as a source of guidance and wisdom. They tell me that God has provided hope for this great nation. 2 Chronicles 7. The Bible says in verse 12, The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an off for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, very famous verse, verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Today I'd like to spend some time just talking about the hope America needs. The hope America needs. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the scriptures. They are the power of God that leads us to salvation. They are the power of God that gives us guidance and instruction in a very complex world that we live in. I thank you that these principles are time-tested and proven and unbreakable. I thank you for your promises that can never be broken. I thank you for your credibility and love that you made sure that you, you have proven beyond a shadow of doubt that you care about us as people. Father, I just pray for wisdom and guidance by the Spirit of God to be able to preach today this message so that we can find hope not in political figures or financial institutions or whatnot, but in the, which is the most sure hope that we can have. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. It was George Washington that said, The establishment of our new government seemed to be the last great experiment for promoting human happiness. This nation has been called the, the great experiment, if you will. The great experiment was the establishment of our constitutional republic. And of course, the, the founders had a vision when they had uh, written up the, the documents that we know today, so, uh, so dear to our hearts, the Constitution and so forth. Uh, I found this quote that kind of explained a little bit of the founders' vision from the National Center for Constitutional Studies. They said this, the, extension, the extensive constitutional republic they envisioned, speaking of the founders, in reality became a place of liberty and opportunity for countless millions of people from all over the world. Their ideas worked. 
because they were based on enduring principles which recognized human imperfection and the need to structure a limited government of laws dependent upon the consent of a people who themselves understood the principles. I thought it was good. That's a good way of kind of summing things up. And I thought about what that, in that quote, it says, the hope for countless millions of people. You know, for, for, for the last few centuries here, this nation has been a place of hope, a place of, of, uh, of a new start, a place where people dream to be, to be part of. I've been up in a variety of places around the world. I've been in 17 different foreign countries in my lifetime. And, I, and I've seen uh, what takes place in some countries, and I'm always glad I come back home to this country that I, I love so much. And I know many of you do as well. And, uh, and I've talked to foreign people before who, who have said, you know what, uh, they, are, they look at me as being a very privileged individual, having a, a U.S. passport and being an American citizen. Many people want to be American citizens, yet even to this day. Because they see in this country something very special. And they see something that, uh, that uh, is unique, that they haven't experienced, and that, that gives them hope for a better tomorrow, if you will. All over the globe, we have people today, too, that have benefited from the existence of this nation. I know there are those that want to go around apologizing for this nation, but let me tell you this. There are places around the globe that are thankful for the United States of America today. Because if it wasn't for, for some of the things we stood for, they would be in slavery. And for some of those people, it gave them a, a, a new future, a brand new start. It's amazing to me. I, I've been on airplanes and I've talked to different people of, who are part of our government or part of our military. And they were going to different countries. I'm like, I didn't know we had a presence there. And it's like, yeah, there's a presence of, uh, of the U.S. military, our diplomats, all over the place. And I thought, wow, what a, what, a, what a blessed thing for our nation to be a, a wonderful influencer, or at least has been a wonderful influencer of some good ideals from in the past. And people have seen that. But yet, even in the early days of our nation, though, the founders themselves knew the frailty of this great experiment, as it was called. Ben Franklin, when he was uh, uh, leaving the the Constitutional Convention there, there was a curious citizen that asked him a question about what had taken place within the, the, the building and, and so forth, and what kind of government that the, that the representatives there gave him. And Benjamin Franklin responded this, and he said, a, a republic, if you can keep it. A republic, if you can keep it. Before the days of America, nations were governed by kings and queens, emperors, czars, and warlords that often extracted gain for themselves and were not always the kindest to their subjects, which a lot of people don't understand. They don't understand how bad uh, at times situations were in different countries. There was a reason uh, the pilgrims fled to this nation. There was a reason people uh, started seeing hope when they were coming here. Because they were getting out, in some cases, some of the most repressive regimes that they possibly could. And it still even happens to this day. But many places around the world were, were governed that way, and, and people were suppressed and, and used and abused and so forth, and had no real say and really no hope of ever uh, gaining any type of uh, position of power to change anything, because a lot of times the kings or the warlords or whomever were, were all often succeeded by their relatives. So there wasn't much change going to take place. Yet our republic transferred power from those at the top to the people. As the founders set up a system that balanced power and made provision to do away with those that abused with that power. But why has this great experience been succeeded for so long? I think beyond all of that stuff, I believe our system was founded upon something very critical. They were divine moral principles that were outlined in Scripture. There are so many quotes that exist from our founders that say, we look to Bible principles of right and wrong in so many words to dictate our laws 
of right and wrong. What was considered punishable by law or not. There's so many that exist out there. See, our code of right and wrong isn't supposed to be defined by the whims of society because the winds of society change. They are changing rapidly like never before in these days. And they'll continue to change. As we have left many of the divine principles that were made this nation great, I believe, based in Judeo-Christian beliefs. Those beliefs are the moral attributes of God himself. In fact, I'll give you some of those quotes I mentioned a moment ago. John Adams, he said, the general principles upon which the fathers achieved independence were general principles of Christianity. This is John Adams, second president of the United States. I will avow that I believe and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. John Quincy Adams, his son, said this, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this, that it connected in one indissolvable bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. Patrick Henry, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. Those are just, that's just a small sample. I have books full of quotes that can be linked back to their original documents of how they viewed things. How important that it was that we had a moral foundation. And the founders saw the, the value Biblical principles as that foundation. I've been to a number of monuments across this country. I've been to D.C. a number of times. I've been on the floor of the House of the Representatives, above where the Speaker of the House sits, and says, in God we trust. You go to a lot of the monuments, at least in some of the older ones, and there's always scripture references. That, that exist on those. Yes, our, our nation, yes, is a founded religious freedom for all peoples, but was based on a moral foundation found in Scripture. And I, and I fear that our nation has really forgotten that. I fear that too many are, are, are afraid to say anything about it. Because I know how nasty some of those people out there can be when you start saying that kind of stuff. We just have to open a history book from the past. You'll see it all over the place. But we are forgetting that we need to have God to sustain us. We need His help. We need Him to guide us. Because we are confronting massive problems today that no government leader can solve. They can come up with a lot of ideas. But the thing is, these problems are getting worse and more complex as the days go on. America needs hope. And the God that helped in her founding can help her in the time of this great distress that we live in right now, both politically, financially, militarily, economically, morally, and most importantly, I believe spiritually. God can make a difference. He's done it in the past. He's done it many times. In fact, I believe there's times he saved our nation from decline in the past through great revivals that took place because people started praying. People got serious. People got tired of uh, just letting things go. And today I'd like to spend a little bit more time giving us some hope in the scripture here. First off, let's talk about the crisis. Now in our text, King Solomon, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, King Solomon is the, the son of King David who brought the nation of Israel really to its zenith as a nation. It became the wealthiest nation on, on the planet at that time. Very powerful nation. And uh, there's a lot I can say about it, but 
It was during the reign of King Solomon they built this construction known as the Jewish Temple. It was the first Jewish Temple. It was built on the site where we know today to be in Jerusalem. It's called the Temple Mount. If you ever see a picture of Jerusalem, there's a there's a blue building with a gold dome. That's the Temple Mount. That's where the first Jewish temple sat in the second one and, and so forth. And they had dedicated this building and Solomon had prayed a long prayer for God's presence and blessing. If you ever read that prayer, it's, it's talking about how uh, he's asking God that if, if the people ever forget you, or ever turn back on you, and, and they've come to realize and they come to this place and pray and seek your face, will you, will you turn back to them? Will, will you hear their prayer? Because Solomon knew human nature. Solomon prayed that God would be gracious to Israel at times when Israel got away from God and as a result was suffering from the consequences of their decisions, their, the consequences of their own sin. Second Chronicles chapter number 6, if you just flip back there, in verse number 24, I'll read here, I'll read quickly. It says, if thy people Israel, this is part of Solomon's prayer, if thy people Israel be put to the worst before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall return and confess thy name, and pray and make supplication before thee in this house. Then hear thou from the heavens, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest to them and to their fathers, when the heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee. Yet if they pray toward this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sin when thou dost afflict them, then hear thou from heaven, and forgive the sin of thy servants and thy people Israel, when thou hast taught them the good way, herein that they should walk and send rain upon thy land, which thou hast given unto thy people for an inheritance. If there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blasting or mildew, locusts or caterpillars, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whosoever sore, uh, or whatsoever sore, whatsoever sickness there be, then... What prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people, Israel, when every one shall know his own sword, his own grief, and shall spread forth his hands in this house, then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive, and render unto every man according unto all his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men, that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways so long as they live in the land which thou gavest unto thy fathers. Now in our text, God promises Solomon, yes. If all these things are happening because of the decisions of people, and they turn back, God says, yeah, I'll hear. I let, that's what verse 14 of 2 Chronicles 7, 14, my people are shall call by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal God said, yes, I'll hear. I'll, I'll hear exactly what you have to say. And I'll help at those times. You know, we're living in days where we're surrounded by great problems. We have crises at home here. We have crises abroad. Now, we elect leaders with hopes and big promises. But sometimes they deliver very little or aren't able to do what they would like to do. And sometimes even what they do deliver make the problem worse. <laughs> Now, we can point the finger at them, and I'm, that's not what I'm doing here today. I ought to start pointing the finger at me for not praying for them as the Bible commands me to. You know, I can blame them, I can blame political parties, I can blame lobbyists, I can blame labor unions, I can blame a whole lot of different people. I can blame churches. But the real blame rests at the foot of a very unpopular word in our society. It's the word sin. Sin is very serious today. Sin is, sin is what is hurting this world like never before. The Bible says in Romans 8.22, For the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. Why? Because of sin. Since Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, mankind has been under this curse of sin, and we all are sinners by nature and by choice. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all of us today. All of us are in that situation. I be one of them. And our sins have a 
have a way of creating these crises. See, Solomon recognized that that would happen. He knew the nature of people. Our founders knew the imperfections of the heart. And sought God to help and remember when times came the people sinned against God. And if they would recognize and turn back. You know, as bad as these kind of crises that come, may I say that they are designed to push us back to God. You know, I believe more than ever God's trying to push us back to Him. Because there is terrible consequences that come from sin. All the time. The Bible says, what sort of man soweth, that shall he also reap. You sow seeds of sin, you reap a bad crop. You sow seeds of righteousness, you, you reap a good crop. That's the principle. And sometimes it takes eating the fruit of what we've done to recognize how bad that fruit really is. But at the same time, too, we can we don't we have a God that just doesn't leave us in a well, you made your bed and sleep in it. He said, if you turn back to me, I'd be more than happy to come back to you. Look, as sincere as, as some government officials are, and some of them very are, I, both sides of the aisle, are very sincere in what they believe and what they're trying to do, I understand that. But they can't solve all of our problems. It seems like every time they try, it, it, it brings up another problem. Our problems stem from a, something the government can't control. The sinfulness of our own lives. That create the crises. Those crises can be good because they can push us again back to God. But there must be secondly the consideration. Now God again responds to Solomon's prayer and says, yeah, I'll help. Absolutely. I love my people. You ever have a doubt that God loves people? You have to study how the crucifixion, the cross of Calvary. There is no doubt after you see that. People, the reason people don't understand God loves them so much is because they don't understand what Jesus all went through to pay for their sin on Calvary's cross. He went through a lot. The just dying for the unjust. And God loves his, most people. He really does. However, there must be a consideration on the people's part. They must be willing to consider their ways. There must be a repentance, if you will. A truthful acknowledgement and forsaking of sin that has brought about the problems being faced. There must be a humble recognition that we have done wrong. That's what it says here. And turn from their, uses very strong words, wicked ways. Then will I hear. Then will I hear. So what do we have to what does our nation have to turn from? Well that we've forgotten God. We've forgotten how he thinks on some things. How he you know, God's got some feelings about some things. We need to consider that. We have to stop blaming God and accusing God of all the evil in the world that He has not done, that He didn't create. It's not His fault. In fact, it would be a lot worse if He had stepped into eternity 2,000 years ago. This world's condition is not God's fault. Mankind chose sin, mankind continues to choose sin, which brings the fruit. God comes in and says, I want to help. I want to pull you out. I want to spare you from some heartache. We can't accuse God. I, I think there was, after the San Bernardino shooting, uh, I think there was a paper out in New York, whatever, uh, made kind of a troubling comment on the front page because there were some presidential candidates at the time that said they were offering prayers for the people. This newspaper said, God's not fixing this. But I'd like to say, why should he if you don't even want him in society? You don't want him in the school, you don't want him in the government, you don't want him anywhere, so why should he step in? You know what's interesting, though, is he still does. In a lot of cases. 
And things sometimes aren't even as worse as they could have been. Had not God been merciful. It, it just appalls me how people like to get so mad at God for all the bad things and, and, and so forth, yet they don't want anything to do with them in their daily life at all. I mean, coming to church is like, you know, boy, I'm, I'm really sacrificing here. It's, you know? I've been to countries today where people will walk for miles just to go to a service. I know I've been in countries today or been around countries where if you got caught with this Bible, you'd be in prison. Today we can just come here and worship. I fear that may be going to waste sooner than we realize. Or may or pay homage to God, but how many really want anything to do with it? Again, we want God's blessings, we want God's protection, yet the obedience to Him, that's kind of, well, no, I don't want to really do that. You know, Jesus said, Luke 6, verse 46, said, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and not do not the things which I say? Powerful <laughs> verse. Convicting verse. <laughs> Now, the reason I believe our society is, is dealing with the problems they are is just seem, and things just seem constantly get worse is because sin is being encouraged and bridled in our society like never before. Proverbs 14.34 says, The righteousness exalted the nation brings it up. But sin is a reproach or tears down any people. We must consider our ways. May I say, it's not going to start in some of the places we think they should start. It's not going to start in Hollywood or D.C. Capitals. Not gonna, that's not where it starts. It starts with those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They claim to be a Christian, if you will. Because that's where God starts. First Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And it first begin at us. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? It starts with those who are who've been saved, those who've been born again, those who trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and claim to be a Christian. God's people. In fact, uh, in our text, God says, if my people, <laughs> my people, We're not talking about the atheists out there, not talking about the agnostic, not talking about the secular humanists or whomever, We're not talking about any of those people. He's talking about God's people, those that, that claim Him as Lord. Have to start and lead the way in acknowledging our pride, our neglect, our apathy, our bitterness and anger. Just the name of it. God holds His people accountable first. Why? Because we're supposed to be there. We're supposed to be there. Yet how many they claim to know God, I love God, and all this kind of stuff, but they act and talk like the world all the time. You know, God's house isn't important. Not as important as the, as the golf course, the lake home, the campground, the sporting event, whatever. And those all have their proper place. Don't misunderstand it. But yet, how many just, oh yeah, God's house, well, you know, whatever. We can come and go. We can take it or leave it. Again, come with me. I'll show you some places. They would love to be able to do what you're doing here today. They really would. Some people would, <laughs> they, they, they wouldn't know what to do with themselves if they could worship so freely. You know, how many of us here today say, God's my Lord, but can I ask you, when was the last time you spent some time literally praying? Spending time speaking to God on behalf of your family, your nation, your community, whatever. The Bible says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3. James chapter 5, the Bible says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Luke 18, 1 says uh, that uh, 
that uh, men ought always to pray and not to faint. There are verse after verse after verse after verse in Scripture that tell us God hears the prayers of His people when they sincerely desire His working. We have access to the Creator of the universe. We need to take full advantage of that. We had access to some high governmental position. We take advantage of that. Well, we've got access to the highest position there is in all the universe, the throne of God. Sadly, too, how many tarnish the name of Christ just by the way they behave? Nobody's perfect, I understand that, but sometimes it's like, whose side are you on? <laughs> Uh, you know, or what they participate in, or what they just put ahead of them. You know, the first commandment is, of the Ten Commandments, what is it? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And how many put other gods before me? Again, I'm not talking about the secular humanist. I'm not talking about the atheist and the agnostic. I'm just talking about those who claim to be a Christian. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, Ye are the salt of the earth. Speaking of Christians, but if the salt have lost his savior, where will shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Salt in those days was a preservative. Get the picture. Those who are a Christian, those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, those who have been born again, you're salt. You're a preservative. But if you lose your savior, in other words, your ability to preserve. Very blunt words. This is, this is not Pastor Warner. This is Jesus Christ. You can look it up in your own time. It says, it is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of man. Ouch, huh? Very direct. It means that there, there's a burden of responsibility on us. You know, in a day and age where we don't want to take responsibility for anything, it's time that God's people take some responsibility. So you know what? It's not all about me. It's about others. It's about God. It's about the future generations to come. That's what it's about. Look, if things are ever going to change in this society, it's because those who know God start acting like it. Right? And begin to be grieved. I am grieved. The ridiculous going on in this nation. Brings my soul that you would believe. And I'll agree with yours. So I'm asking God for help. And I believe there are people that are. I really do. Because they see what's coming down the road. There must be consideration. Just can't keep going on the same way we are, Christian. Thirdly, let's talk about the calling quickly. Verse 14 again. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Look, if we meet the conditions to call upon God, He promises to step in and provide for us. Provide for I'm so thankful that no matter what there is going on, that God is not stopped by human obstacles. This is a great verse. Jeremiah 32, 27. This is God speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. He says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Absolutely not. You look, into, you look at the creation itself. It's as infinitely small as it is infinitely big. And you can say, you believe God created that. And you can honestly say, yeah, there's, there's nothing too hard. You may be dealing with a personal situation right now. There's nothing too hard for God. If you come to Him for the help, the same for our nation. We have a God who can do anything if called upon, then there is hope. Now, can I say this? It may not happen in our time frame. Oh, I've got a perfect set time that I want to see this all happen. It might not happen that way. Or in a way we think it should. But there is hope for this nation in God Himself. It really is. And I think we need Him more than ever. I really do. 
I think of these words spoken by Ronald Reagan. He said this, to preserve our blessed land, we must look to God. It is time to realize that we need God more than He needs us. We also have this promise that we should take to heart with regard to our country, that if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We need Him more than He needs us. Boy, don't we need Him. God didn't create us to be independent of Him. He created us dependent on Him. When things, when things are in that right order, everything just works for Him. Now, our hope isn't in the next election. Even if it was the best candidate we could ever possibly get, it's not in the next election. It's not going to be in the educational system. It's not going to be in Wall Street, the military, or anything like that. Our hope, I believe, is found in churches and in people that are looking to God for help and doing what He's telling us to do based on the demands of His Word. May God help us see the urgency of the hour. I mean, the hour is urgent. May God spur us to seek Him to act according to His divine direction so that future generations may have the opportunities we have to worship and live freely under the protection and the guidance of the Almighty God that we serve. God help us and God give us grace in these days to do right. May God bless our country. At this time, what we like to do is